Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Anna Jimenez McMillan. In our show this time, we'll visit the April meeting of the Honolulu Science Cafe at Hasser Bistro for a talk about research on box jellyfish. The speaker was Dr. Angel Yanagihara of the Pacific Biosciences Research Center at UH Manoa. She called her talk, The Science of the Sting. The Honolulu Science Cafe, there are many science cafes around the world, recently met downtown for a special talk by Dr. Yanagihara, one of the foremost researchers on box jellyfish. These are known in science as cubozoans. Cubozoans, of which some 50 species are found in tropical and temperate oceans around the world, are fatal. They take their name from their cubic body, which has long tentacles growing from the four corners. The tentacles have thousands of specialized cells that fire microscopic harpoons at more than 60 kilometers an hour. The harpoons carry spiny tubes that inject the venom. Tropical box jellyfish stings kill more people every year than sharks. Current estimates are about 500 deaths per year, but many others go unreported. 90% of these deaths are among young children in rural Filipino fishing villages. Dr. Yanagihara has traveled to these villages to study these incidents and help people deal with them. Dr. Yanagihara was born in Alaska and obtained her undergraduate degree at the University of Virginia and her PhD at UH for research on cellular ion channels. Her work on box jellyfish was triggered by a near fatal sting she experienced in an attack by a swarm of box jellyfish in Waikiki. That happened in 1997, the year she took her PhD. Box jellyfish almost killed her. Now she wants to save others from their venom. She is now the director of the Pacific Nadaria Research Laboratory and an associate research professor with joint appointments at the UH Pacific Biosciences Research Center, the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, SOEST, and the Department of Tropical Medicine at the John A. Burns School of Medicine at UH, JABSM. Dr. Yanagi Hara studies the biochemistry and the pathophysiological effects of the venom that box jellyfish inject into their victims. She has developed patented products, a spray and a cream, under the name Sting No More, to counter the venom. She is famous and considered one of the world's foremost experts on jellyfish. She was chosen as a Fulbright specialist to conduct her research in Thailand last summer. And her work was the subject of a recent article in the prestigious journal Science. Her work is not without some controversy, however. Her unified field theory holds that box jellyfish venom contains proteins, including one called porin, that puncture red blood cells and release potassium, disrupting the electrical rhythms of the heart. Her findings, and the treatments she has based on them, are the result of 20 years of research that her colleagues praise as thorough and imaginative. Among the five research groups in the world that study this subject, however, there are some that say other compounds in the venom are the real killers. Dr. Yanagi Hara acknowledges that jellyfish venom contain other toxins, including molecules that break down lipids and proteins, but her studies show that porins are the main and fastest killer. Resolving the debate will require more research on venom pathology and treatment, plus funding, which would be easier to get if researchers could develop more accurate reports on the worldwide number of stings and deaths from these dangerous animals. Dr. Yanagi Hara is not unknown to Think Tech. We visited her at UH Manoa a couple of years ago where she gave us a tour of her laboratory and showed us her venom experiments firsthand. It was the kind of place where you would want to be really careful on what you touched. We have basically everything in this laboratory to go from keeping a live marine animal for a few days, to purifying the venom, to doing the bioassays, um, to preparing potential inhibitors and treatments that can be tested for um, the ability to treat stings. This week we were doing some experiments with live animal tentacles and we tested some of the common things that are out there, uh, the effect of shaving cream, um, hot packs and cold packs, um, as well as our own technology again. Here are tentacles in seawater, and they're still alive. You see how they're pink? If you put them on your arm, you would be stung they're instantly. Moving. Yeah. This is blood agarose, 
and these clear zones are where the venom has been injected and is lysing the red blood cells and that's why it's clear. If we take um, another piece of tentacle for instance, this one, and we lay it back on the blood agarose again, you can see right now it's contacting. If we go look under the microscope, you'll see that the nidae are discharging. And after five minutes, we remove the tentacle and we do different treatment. So we see if our treatment reduced hemolysis or increased hemolysis. And some of our treatments massively reduce hemolysis. And some things make it uh, make no difference or even make it worse. So this is a method that we invented. Um, so it's a novel contribution on our part to the field. Part of the problem in this field is that there isn't enough, uh, there aren't enough studies, there aren't enough labs doing it, and it has historically required human volunteers. So, so there's where the tentacle was. Okay. So you see yeah. that see the streak there? This other one to the right was on there, had been, was in the incubator for five hours. Where I laid the tentacle, there's a track of the tiny stinging capsules. They're left stuck on the surface. Each of these tiny nidae are filled with the venom. So whenever a tentacle contacts your skin, uh, many, many undischarged nidae are left there. So the, the red blood cells um, are having holes pierced in them, hemoglobin seeping out, and so there's a clear zone. So you can see both where the nidae were left on the agarose, just physically left there, as well as the clear zone of, of the activity. This assay looks at one particular one, which we find to be the worst offender and to be necessary and sufficient for causing death in a mouse or in a piglet and presumably in the human being. So that's why our technologies have all been dedicated towards inhibiting this particular activity. In any event, here is the footage we took of her most interesting talk at the Science Cafe. The specialized structure that defines the phylum Nidaria are nidae, and this uh, little graphic animation shows what's been reported to be the fastest known cellular biological event, which is the discharge of the penetrant nidae called nematocysts. And these tiny microscopic capsules will discharge at bullet speed and bullet force a hollow tubule which basically acts like a hypodermic needle and these are hundreds to thousands of these per linear centimeter of contact with the tentacle. So one doesn't have a venom that is just topically applied but is forcibly injected and in some cases up to a millimeter or deeper into the skin. 
Within the phylum Cnidaria, there are a number of, of different classes. Tonight we're going to talk about class Cubozoa, and Cubo, you readily would see box. So these animals all have a box-like body shape. They don't have the radial symmetry that you might be used to thinking about with jellyfish, the moon jellies, etc. So they have four corners, and from each corner is what's called a pedalia, and then from that is one tentacle in the case of the cryptids, and up to 15 tentacles in the chiridropids. These um, particular families then uh, all together comprise about 40 different species of box jellyfish, not all of which are lethal stingers. And in Hawaii, we are fortunate that uh, our main problem, if you will, is this Alatina, Alatina alata in the Alatina day. And that animal has the four corners and one tentacle. And uh, reviewing over 20 years of case stories, I think that one could potentially attribute deaths uh, of three individuals over that period of time. But it's nothing like the deaths of the notorious chiridropids. From the standpoint of impacts, this uh, shows you the number of these cubozoa in various parts of the world. You can readily see that they're mostly tropical and subtropical, um, but the Caribbean, US and between Mexico and South America, has quite a diverse number of species of cubozoa. Uh, as in Hawaii, we have th three to four, arguably. Um, and then you see the most intense distribution of biodiversity of cubozoa in this Indo-Pacific region. Within um, the U.S. waters, Puerto Rico is also afflicted with uh, various cryptidids. Um, this is a, a stings of a young uh, woman who contacted me uh, after a horrible case of mismanagement. Um, and this really pointed me early on into the importance of eventually addressing uh, first aid. These hot spots in red are over 20 deaths. And uh, when I first began to look into this, I thought it was probably about equally distributed between the Philippines, Thailand, and that the reports of deaths in Australia Actually, having visited Australia many times now, one sees wonderful public health outreach. So there's beautiful signs uh, in Darwin, in all of the affected areas. You go to the beach and there's a, a glorious 10-foot tall sign with you know, robust Australians wearing their stinger suits from head to toe and telling you the picture of the box jellyfish and then they have a vinegar pole st stocked to the max with full bottles of vinegar. Um, so basically, they are way mm. ahead of the curve as far as public health uh, information, outreach, education, and just uh, changing the culture. The real tragedies seem to be in the Philippines. And each of these numbers represents at least 12 deaths. So unfortunately, uh, with the complete maritime culture and the fact that um, most of these areas that are heavily impacted by this chirodropid, the most lethal um, family of jellyfish, are marginalized what they call fisher folk. So over 7,000 islands comprise the Philippines. And in these coastal zones, um, many of these places are cashless societies. Uh, where there is essentially no income and they're bartering, etc. So you can imagine then access to modern care, even if it were possible to save lives, uh, would be uh, futile. So when we went out to visit the sites of some of these deaths, um, it became readily apparent to me that the heavy lift here was going to be in the public health outreach and education. And this is a story that you might have seen um, just last year. It's a child whose mother is Filipina and she was, being, uh, she was growing up in Italy and had just won a junior Olympic swimming com um, competition and went home with her mother for a holiday and she ended up being stung by a box jellyfish. The boat handler advised first aid the first aid that he used was gasoline. 
So he poured the gasoline on the child and the child died. Um, when we've interviewed, again, over uh, 600 fisher folk and other uh, barangay workers, gasoline is one of the common answers. And how this has become uh, sort of ossified in the public domain is you can imagine if you're a fisherman off at sea, what do you have? Not very much, but hopefully you do have enough gasoline to get home. But you can imagine the level of pain that a box jellyfish sting would cause you that you would think to use gasoline. So an adult man who gets stung and is desperate for some remedy, trying gasoline, if they happen to survive the gasoline, they attribute the survival to the gasoline. So this is the lack of evidence-based first aid. The same sort of thing we see with the Friends television show about urine. So people uh, got stung at the beach in New Jersey. They recommended to each other that somebody needed to urinate on the person. So they did so, and the person got better. So then they attributed that to the application of urine. Is there any evidence for that? Is it helpful or harmful? So we went and developed assays that were models of tissue, human tissue, that we could sting and then apply various first aids, including urine and gasoline, et cetera. Our um, efforts at the bench are to do rigorous science, to have statistically powered, uh, well-designed experiments we spend years doing, uh, then we can bring that data to the public and we can provide some um, information that could lessen human suffering and deaths. Coming back to our interviews of coastal folks, uh, we ask them um, how confident do they feel in treating box jelly stings? And you can see the honesty here. There's basically 85% were either no, very uncertain or had no idea. The most certain group we found were the men, the fishermen, and they were about 50% confident that gasoline was your, your go-to <laughs> answer. But amongst the, the coastal health workers, 85% um, were very uncertain. And so this really showed us the need for our work in this field. So I invested the last four years on this topic to do uh, first aid um, research, basically using both a tissue model and an animal model and human case retrospective studies to really dig in deeply and to be able to publish rigorous uh, results. The most common area for stings is basically right offshore of, of these areas, the ponds. And this is where I go to collect the jellyfish. Um, and this is a beam of, of the, the Kapahulu groin out at the 300 foot drop. I'm at the surface and here's one of these animals coming up. You see it's glistening white uh, because it's filled with gametes. It's either a male or a female. So they're coming in purposefully to spawn. They're very strong swimmers. They're not just floating. Uh, it's not being driven by a current. They're actually swimming against the current. We scuba divers were out there and we got dragged diamond head, um, but the, we couldn't keep up with the box jelly. So they're really strong swimmers. So um, the takeaway lesson then, if you had to run out the door right now, would be to rinse the tentacles off with vinegar and then soak the limb in hot water. Uh, 45 minutes actually is even better. Um, and, and that applies to all of these. It's interesting that biochemically these venoms are very heat sensitive. So it's not the same as boiling. You don't have to be in scalding water. They, it doesn't take very high heat. Uh, they're nowhere as heat resistant as our human proteins are. So we can use that to our advantage. All the marine uh, proteins that have ever been looked at in all of in the venomous fishes, et cetera, um, all have been shown to be uh, effectively um, Re reducing their activity by hot water. So this is a really remarkable attribute about them as well. And it actually, it kind of harkens back to the Hawaiian moon calendar. Right. Because yes. during that Kaloa phase, yes. one isn't supposed to be out at right. night the in the ocean. the ocean. Exactly. Right. Yes. And that is when they come up, right. Yes. So, so that's... That's their trigger to come to the shore to spawn once a month.
exactly. Within the, the geological time and animal life on the planet, because they were king of the hill for so long, they basically had to outdo one another for the venom. Um, they overshot the mark. There is no animal that <laughs> is resistant. Um, one could say, though, for instance, turtles, because of the thickness of their esophagus, etc., alimentary canals, they are capable of, of ingesting the, even the most lethal of the, of the box jelly. <coughs> But the venom itself um, is cytolytic on all animals. It's interesting because we've reared some in the lab just to see how many days things take. And when they get to a certain point on the little tentacle arms, they have a couple of nine days. And then when they release, and it's just juvenile medusae, then they do have the same authentic nine day that we find in the adults. And part of the sea lice phenomenon could be the sudden um, strabulation of the juvenile medusae. Sensitivity and uh, allergy, these are things that get bandied about, um, but actually it isn't anything like bee stings where one can be sensitive or have an allergic reaction. Um, having said that, the dose, it's a dose-dependent outcome. And for those who have thinner skin, uh, children and elderly, women and children, um, there is, they're more at risk, but I wouldn't use the word necessarily sensitive. Want to know more about Dr. Yanagihara and her work on box jellyfish and their deadly venom? See pbrc.hawaii.edu. Want to know more about her anti-venom products? See stingnomore.com. And now, let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on ThinkTechHawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash audio, and we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links, or better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories.
ThinkTech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our shows, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during a show, call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and the events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Anna, that wraps up this week's edition of Think Tech. Remember, you can watch Think Tech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Anna does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more Think Tech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on Think Tech, visit thinktechhawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. And I'm Anna Jimenez-McMillan. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.